Hello, everyone. This is number nine in my ongoing series that I've titled Interpretations of Biblical Prophecy Through the Ages from Ancient to Modern Times. I'm just calling it Bible Prophecy for short. And by the Bible, I mean the Hebrew Bible or Old Testament, as Christians call it, and the New Testament. This particular episode is part two. Number eight was part one. And I call it the job description of the Messiah. And by the Messiah, I mean the Davidic figure, the person who's supposed to come, according to the Hebrew Bible, at the end of days, who will be a descendant of King David and will be what people popularly call today the Messiah. And that would be Jews, Christians, and Muslims all have this idea of a singular Davidic figure. Now, Muslims and Christians think that is Jesus of Nazareth, and he will come back a second time to fulfill all of these prophecies. And the majority of Jews who do not accept Jesus as the Messiah would be waiting for one to come who would fulfill these things, at least if a more literal interpretation is offered. Later at the end of the series, I'll talk about all kinds of alternative ways to interpret the Messiah or the Davidic Messiah. But right now, we're just trying to get the text down. We did Daniel. Now we're going through these Messianic prophecy texts. So let me share my screen and we'll get started. I've got just a couple of preliminary things. And I'm going to start with this web page from YouTube. So this is my YouTube channel. Uh, thank you for those of you who follow me. You can see that my subscriptions are up. I'd love to have you subscribe and hit notifications for a little ding when I post something. I'm going to be posting a lot. I just finished uh, some major, major projects. And now as I look ahead into the next few months, I've got a full agenda and we'll be putting up things uh, at least three times a week, maybe more often. But if you go down here to this uh, particular section, special series, this is where we are. I just want everybody to see this because we pick up a lot of new people all the time who might say, well, this is number nine. Uh, where do I find the others and so forth? So if you go to James Tabor videos on YouTube, scroll on down to special series and I'll hit the playlist here, full playlist. And as you can see, number eight was part one, job description of the Messiah. Has anyone ever done any of this? And I'm going to label it part one to make it clear. And what I'm doing today will be part two. But as you can work on back, you see all the way down to here, you see the previous programs. Now, do you need to go back and hear all of these? before you hear this one today. I don't think you do, but I mean, that would be up to you if you wanted to do that. But probably you wanna hear this one because it is part one of what I'm going to do today. If you had to write a job description, you were hiring the Messiah. Here's what you need to do if you wanna to claim to be the Messiah. Uh, you, you would be following what I'm uh, covering here. So let me close that. So here's my blog. It's easy, jamestabor.com. And the search feature on this blog is really quite efficient. So let's say I type in uh, apocalyptic, messianic, eschatology. I always have my students learn that. It's a real mouthful. Eschatology is the idea of the end of the cosmos or the end of the age. Apocalyptic means what are the signs of that end coming? So you can kind of plot the trajectory. And messianic, we're dealing with here, the idea of a Messiah coming, particularly a Davidic Messiah, although we've already seen in the text that we've looked at so far, there are two Messiahs. There's also a priestly Messiah, and I'll briefly review that today. And that was also covered in part eight. Uh, here, by the way, I just see it here, is my new course on the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, this guy here, I love this picture. I, I had, it's a composite I created, but I just love the expression of it. 
Uh, he essentially, I'm calling the first Messiah, and there's a segment already done on that. But let's say we do this search back up here, apocalyptic messianic eschatology. And there we go. And if you choose the very first entry that comes up, apocalyptic messianic eschatology, and then I said, now that's a mouthful, and it is, and you click on that, Look what you're going to get. You're going to get all of this material that I've been covering with Daniel and so forth. But here's what I want you to notice. We are going to cover all of these texts. Now, do you realize these are the texts for Messianic Hebrew thought in the Hebrew Bible? So we're going to cover all of these, and we've already covered quite a few. Here's Daniel. We've done some of Isaiah and Zechariah and so forth. But right now we're going to work on the Davidic ruler. But you can find this post on my blog by doing that search, jamestabor.com, and you could uh, highlight or even print out the whole thing. And you'd have a list of what we're covering. We're jumping around a little bit, but basically this is the list. Okay, now uh, over to the right in the sidebar, where the search is. Here's a newsletter that I have. If you sign up for that, you'll get a monthly, at least, inside kind of uh, description of what I'm working on. It's only for the people that subscribe. It's not secret necessarily, but you hear things before they come out, any kind of breaking news or whatever. And also, uh, if you want to join my Patreon, my Patreon is not really for fundraising. I don't live off of it. It's essentially to segregate a group that follow my work that would be willing to contribute a very minimal amount. I think the lowest is $5 a month. But my idea here is to differentiate the vast YouTube audience that I have so that the few that really want to delve in and follow uh, are part of this, and I meet with them once a month on Zoom, and we can talk about things I've been doing and things they've been doing, and it's conversational. It's not a webinar. Everybody's together on the screen, and uh, a lot of people have found it really valuable, and everybody gets the same no matter what level you donate. You remember the book of James? I like following that in this case. If someone who's rich comes into my Patreon, they don't get to sit up front. They don't get any more than someone who uh, contributes less. I just want interested, committed people who love to delve into this stuff and talk with me. But I want it to be people that are open-minded and considerate and respectful, and we can have all kinds of differences, but we share what we know. And then you could also sign up for notifications because I post a lot on the blog. While I'm here, notice the uh, bookshelf. That's a new feature. I'll click on that and you can see the books that I'm recommending. I own the book, I've read the book, and I love the book and think you should buy it. You won't go wrong buying any of these books. And I got a lot more to come. If you wanna look at my books, uh, I have eight that are available now because some are out of print. I'm going to reissue them. But there you go. And you've got all kinds of reviews and you've got the links with Amazon. So take a look at that. I haven't promoted the blog too much, but I think it will be interesting to many of you. So let me get out of that. And I'm going to switch over to our presentation today. So this is the first slide dealing with the general topic of the idea of the Messiah or Messiahs. And I'll just flip through really quick uh, where you can kind of review. Messiah means anointed one. It can be a priest or a king. It literally is mashak. It means to pour oil on the head. It's a special oil that was made in the Torah. Here you see Moses is anointing Aaron, every priest is anointed, and eventually then the kings are also anointed. Now, you can pause the video if you haven't read these yet, and you can also go back and hear the previous episodes where I actually go through and discuss them. Uh, however, Messiah is even used for Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, meaning my chosen ones, my anointed ones, my delegated ones, my selective ones. 
that kind of idea. Uh, even uh, King Cyrus, King of Persia, is called an anointed one because he's the one that was used in the Hebrew Bible to let the people go from Babylonian captivity because the Persians conquered the Babylonians. And here, thus says uh, Jehovah or Yahweh to Cyrus, his anointed, his Messiah. So you can see that Messiah can have a number of meanings. Now, here's where we were. What are the two things in the Hebrew Bible that God never said he wanted, according to the Hebrew Bible? And those are an anointed king and a temple with its sacrifices. So think about that. I'm going to be talking about the king right here. The temple I'll hold for another series in the future. Did God ever want sacrifice? It's a great topic. But what about a king? Well, we know in the book of Samuel that when it is first proposed that there's going to be a king, God is pretty upset about it. And although he allows a king, according to the story, he says, you have rejected me as king. So it's seen as an accommodation because according to the text, Israel wanted to be like the nations. Now, here's something that surprises people. I showed you that list of all the texts. There are 10 basic texts in the Hebrew prophets, and I mark them one through 10 below, that are usually taken as specific references to this future Davidic king or Messiah. In other words, an anointed one who's of the lineage of King David, okay? And I went through, I think, the first six, uh, Isaiah 9. Somebody pointed out uh, this translation that I suggested, wonderful counselor, is the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. I think that's a good possibility. It also could be the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father will call him the Prince of Peace. Uh, I prefer this, but because all the time in Isaiah, people get names based upon God's attributes. And I think that's what this is. You also have it in other places in Isaiah earlier in the book, like Isaiah's children, they get meaningful names that are kind of long like this. Okay, so let's go on. That was number one. Number two was Isaiah 11. That goes for two slides because it's a huge passage. You can go back and hear that. Number three is Isaiah 16, very short. And then Jeremiah 23, it's repeated again in 33, but we don't count it twice. And that's about a Tzemach David, a branch of David. So we know that's a way of talking about a descendant of David is coming. And here you have Zechariah 3. My servant, the branch, the Semach, is going to come. This is during the Persian period. So even though Cyrus the Great allowed the Jews to go back and leave Babylon, Cyrus the Messiah, remember, the anointed one, the chosen one, God's servant, uh, he did not allow them to anoint a king. He did allow them to anoint a priest. Number four, this is the man again, whose name is the branch, the Semach David. He's going to branch out, and he'll build the temple of God, and he will bear the glory and sit and rule on his throne. So he's clearly a king of the Davidic line. But notice this, there will be a priest by his throne, and the council of peace shall be between them both. So that was number six, and we've got four more to go to get our ten. So let's go to seven. This is new today. Uh, this is Psalm 110, 1 through 7. I'm going to suggest a translation. This is the Revised Standard Version. Very interesting text. This text is quoted more in the New Testament in talking about the Messianic hope than any other text. It's a difficult text. This text is quoted by Jesus the last days of his life when he's teaching in the temple in Jerusalem. And he's been questioned, should we pay taxes? What about divorce? And so forth. And finally, he asks his very antagonistic enemies, why do the scribes say 
that the Messiah is a son of David. Well, everybody knows the Messiah is a son of David. So why does Jesus ask that question and what does he think the answer is? Well, he quotes these verses, so let's take a look at it. Uh, I'll just use Yahweh. It's the most common scholarly designation. Yahweh says to my Lord, now that's not the Lord Jehovah, that's like my boss, my master. So David is writing, follow this, and God, Yahweh, says to David's Lord. Now, now we get quotes. He's going to say this to David's master. Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Okay, that's clear. Rule in the midst of your foes. So this is a very triumphant messianic passage. Your people will offer themselves freely on the day you lead your host upon the holy mountains. So this Messiah is leading a force, an army. From the womb of the morning, like dew, your youth will come to you. So this one's going to get all kinds of strength from God. Uh, Yahweh has sworn and will not change his mind. And then a quote, you are a priest forever. And here's the standard translation, after the order of Melchizedek. Now, I think this is incorrect. I don't think this has anything to do with the figure Melchizedek mentioned in the book of Hebrews as a kind of type or representation of Christ before he came in the book of Genesis. Actually, it doesn't say you're a priest forever after the order of, like there's a new priestly order. The only order of priests, essentially, is that of Aaron, the brother of Moses, as we've seen, as far as people being anointed. But here's somebody who's of the line of David is told, you are a priest. Now, a priest can mean a representative. It doesn't have to be somebody of the priestly lineages of Aaron. So in this case, it's clearly being addressed to someone of Davidic lineage. So let's look at the literal translation. You are a priest forever, according to my word, O my king of righteousness, or O my righteous king. It could be phrased in different ways, but you get the idea. So someone is going to be declared king forever, and that one will be my righteous king. Now look at what he's going to do. The Lord, and that is actually Adonai, it's not the name of God, but it, and it used in the plural, it means Lord of Lords. So the Lord of all Lords is at your right hand. He will shatter kings on the day of his wrath. He will execute judgment among the nations and so forth. So it's very, very similar to the kind of thing that we get in the other passages that we've already covered, particularly Isaiah 11 and so forth, shattering enemies, setting up the rule of God, executing judgment on the nations. So that's number seven. A pretty exalted figure, I think you'd agree. Number eight. Now, this is very interesting. This is quoted in the New Testament when Jesus rides into the city the week before Passover on a donkey or a colt. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Daughter of Zion is a way of referring to Jerusalem. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. That's Hebrew parallelism. Lo, your king comes to you triumphant and victorious is he, humble and riding on an ass, on the colt of the foal of an ass. So if you remember in the story with Jesus, it's a very small animal. And you get the idea here that an ass is a beast of burden. And when a full adult male rides an ass, uh, it's kind of ludicrous. First of all, the way I'm not going to represent it here in my chair, but it's kind of like you're going around like this. You can't have a lot of dignity. Whereas on a horse, you would be triumphant. So this is emphasizing the humility that this one is going to be victorious, but also humble. And if you remember in Isaiah 11, it talks about his spiritual traits. So the idea is he's not just a conqueror. He's a servant. So in the Hebrew Bible, for example, King Solomon, son of David, the third king of Israel, he rode an ass down to the Gihon Spring and was anointed 
as king of Israel, showing humility and service. Then it goes on to say, I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim or Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem. This is Hebrew parallelism, meaning there won't be any more war and the battle bow shall be cut off. And he, this one, this king is going to command peace to the nations. Wow. Think of Isaiah 2, beating the swords into plowshares and the spears into pruning hooks and so on, or the wolf lying with the lamb. His dominion shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. The river is the river Euphrates to the ends of the land or the ends of the earth. It'll be, in other words, very widespread. So that's number eight. And of course, in the New Testament, there was the claim that Jesus had fulfilled that. But notice what he's to do is not only come humble, riding on an ass, but also triumphant and victorious. And he's supposed to cut off war and bring peace to the world, which hasn't happened yet. Number nine, very short one. In that day, and you can read the context in the book of Amos, I will raise up the booth of David, a tent of David. So, you know, the Davidic line, as we've said, was cut off uh, when the Babylonians invaded Jerusalem. And you had a series of kings, uh, Zedekiah being the main one, who were the last of the line of David, and even uh, Coniah or Jeconiah, who was declared unfit to rule. But uh, here you're raising up the tent of David. So that's the house of David. It's going to be raised up. And it's got breaches and ruins. In other words, it's been devastated. So instead of a stump with a sprout, we've got the image of a building or even a tent that has fallen down. And it'll be rebuilt as in the days of old. That they may possess the remnant of Eden and all the nations who are called by my name, says the Lord who does this. And that's the word Yahweh, of course. So there you get a little more. And now, ready? Number 10. Now, this one will surprise you, I think, because it's quoted in the New Testament at the birth of Jesus, you know, that Jesus is born in Bethlehem. But I want you to notice something here. Is this the town of Bethlehem or is this a person? So let's read it and, and just consider this alternative. But you... O Bethlehem Ephratah, who are little to be among the clans of Judah. So is this a clan of Judah? I think it is. Judah is one of the 12 sons of Jacob. David is of the lineage of that tribe of Judah, okay? But Judah had other sons, as we're going to see. So from one of the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me, one who's to be ruler in Israel. Where is he going to come from? We have to find this clan or this tribe. And he, his origin is from old, from ancient days. And so you've got to trace him all the way back to Judah. That could be hundreds and hundreds of years going back, thousands from our time. Therefore, he will give them up until the time when she is in travail has brought forth. Then the rest of his brethren shall return to the people of Israel. So this is in the book of Micah. It's talking about the northern captivity and people going into captivity, 10 of the tribes of Israel in 721 BCE and thereafter. And they never return to the land. And the Jews go under Babylon in the 6th century, 587, and they do return in part to the land, but this is talking about a future ideal time. And he, this figure, will stand and feed his flock in the strength of Jehovah, in the majesty of the name of Jehovah, his God. So this is a Jew, a Messiah who worships God, and Yahweh is his God. And they will dwell secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth. So now this one who's going to come from you will come forth a ruler. But the question is, is it the town of Bethlehem? Is it King David? Notice the little asterisk, and I put a note here. This Bethlehem Ephrathah 
is a clan of Judah, not a person. Okay. And it's not a town. Let's keep reading the note. This is a person or a clan, not a place of the tribe of Judah, but a descendant of her. Okay, here it is. This is in the book of Chronicles. First Chronicles chapter four. The sons of Judah are Perez, Hezron, Carmi, Hur, and Shobel. Now, Jesus comes from Perez. You got five sons here. Her is the clan that's spoken of here. These were the sons of Her, the firstborn of Ephratah, the father of Bethlehem. So Bethlehem is actually a person way back in the lineage. So this particular king, if it's the same as all the other uh, kings, uh, seems to have a kind of a different tradition. So I'm going to stop the share. So think about this. Uh, only 10 texts. I mean, 10 is a good number, but uh, that last one kind of throws you for a loop. And also Psalm 110. But if you put this out on a grid and start mapping the characteristics, I know some of you really study with me some of the material. Go back and make some columns with all 10 down the side and list the different things they're supposed to do. You'll see a lot of uh, overlap. Uh, I'm going to do some of that for you next time in the next episode, which will be episode 10, and we'll put it all together. But here's my question. If this is the job description of the coming Davidic Messiah, has anyone ever fulfilled any of these things yet? And I leave that with you to think about. Take care, everybody.